uh, scientist and pathologist at Woodford Pathology Farm. So it is my great pleasure to introduce a great young scientist from Griffith University who I have the pleasure to meet a couple of years ago. Uh, his name is Dr. Muhammad Siddiqui. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in the School of Environment and Sciences at Griffith University. He obtained his PhD from Pushan National University, South Korea. And following his PhD, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Monash University and Australian Research Council, DECRA fellow at the University of Queensland. Prior to joining Griffith University, he was an associate group leader in the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology, which we call AIBN, at the University of Queensland. His research career was um, uh, uh, been a his research career has been dedicated to understanding microfluidics, electrochemistry, and surface chemistry based uh, phenomena for the development of diagnostic methods and devices that enable disease biomarkers in human to be measured. Currently, he is he involved in developing functional nanomaterial based on portable devices for diagnosing, measuring, and treating cancer, infectious, and tropical diseases. So you can see he actually came from human pathogen detection, and he is one of the well-known in the microfluidics and electrochemistry and nanotechnology community in Australia. So he is a fantastic career. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Siddiqui to present his presentation, how this plant pathogen can meet the novel class of magnetic nanozyme for the plant disease diagnostic. So this is the translating the human diagnostic into a plant diagnostic. I look forward to hear from Dr. Siddiqui. Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, thank you, Samsul. Um, it was really great to, you know, um, get such a nice introduction. Um, yes, I'm just trying um, to do do something and translating some of our um, human pathology technologies to plant. Um, okay, um, as you can see, um, actually I'll be uh, next to, I think around 40 plus minutes, I'll be driving you guys uh, to to some of the technology what we are uh, developing in the lab um, and trying to find out um, varieties of the different applications. Mainly I'll be showing one of the um, um, translation uh, how this uh, or our journey to translate some of our plant pathogenic uh, you know, um, uh, technology like where um, from the human um, diagnostics or human pathology to how we translate this one in the in the you know, plant pathology side. So um, in the uh, my Samsul uh, rightly said you know my my career a little bit. Um, so whole of my career was to understand uh, some of the you know, diagnostic devices to detect cancer in the early stage. So as you can see, the early stage cancer detection has um, a major um, goal in there, which is we would like to um, manage these diseases properly um, by detecting them a little bit earlier. So if we detect this disease early at the very onset of the disease or very close to the onset time, what would happen is actually we can better manage the disease. And this is how we can increase the survival rate um, in, uh, you know um, that could actually save a lot of life. So, but then, as a as a, if you look at this on current technologies, what we have at this moment, actually, it started with this uh, close to a half a million dollar in you know, capital cost to go high, even you know, a seven million dollar capital cost we have. But um, if you look at this again, um, when we, we send a sample or we, we try to understand or diagnose any diseases there, it also takes time. 
you know. And sometimes it is multiple people involved, a lot of expert involved, oncologists involved, a lot of, you know, things there. Which is a bit of uh, still uh, we are going in the complication stage. <clears throat> but then if you look at in the other side of the story, this you'll see this some of the devices is already in the market uh, uh, and, and we can use this at home. And this will um, start with uh, only, you know, several K. I mean, capital cost is not too high. And if you if some of them even you can buy uh, from the from the commercial source. For example, this one is a pregnancy detection kit is a best example for uh, clinical friendly devices. And you also many of you know that, uh, you know, like diabetes, um, uh, diabetics you know, devices or strip are also uh, another example of the clinical friendly devices. So these are the examples where uh, people actually is uh, moving towards this direction, which I would say this is called like you know at home medicine and which is not too far and we are driving towards this direction but then um if i look at you know what what was my driving force in you know last if in last 10 15 years we're trying to develop some of the technology so these are the some of the work we are doing in the lab basically what we do in the left this corner you can see different level of the biomarker and i'm sure i'm not i'm not going to explain what the biomarker is so and and what what importance of detecting this biomarker? So this biomarker is uh, basically by detecting this of the signature molecule in the early stage of the diseases, you can essentially actually um, you know diagnose or can get get confirmation that the disease is present there. But um, in a quantity, it, they can be quantitative, they can be also qualitative, both. But then in my lab, mainly we are dry, you know, trying to develop some of the genetic screening process or methods and also some of the portable devices for, um, you know, um, moving this one at, in, towards the at-home at -home medicine. So this uh, mainly what we do as a fluid sample, we target mainly, you know, body fluid. I can say this blood, urine, or saliva. And our whole target is non-invasive diagnostics, means the liquid biopsy type of the technology. So uh, one, uh, you know, I would like to just keep two examples what we are doing here. One of the example is this is the nano sharing one device which developed almost um, in almost now six, seven years before. That device is, is the way it works is brilliant. Like the way it can actually pick up uh, some of the cancer cell in the presence of the billions and millions of the other non-target specific molecules. And it has a cute technology underneath. There is a strong physics there behind there. We can tune up and down, down the forces uh, in there and, and specifically can pick up this, you know, uh, the right one. In that particular example is the red one is our target one and all these other ones non-target, which we can wash away. Uh, this nano sharing device is, is a platform for many, not for a one particular cancer. It can it can reply, it, it is using as a platform for the many other cancer devices. Uh, cancer detection. Another example I'd like to show this non interfacial biosensing device, which I spent a quite significant amount of time on it since since initial publication came in uh, 2014, and since then there's a lot of work going on. Ultimately, what we are doing here is when when we say this, you know, some disease molecule, and then if comparing the disease a normal molecule the physiologically or physiochemical property of these two molecules, a disease molecule and non-disease molecule are different. By using the some of the cute you know feature in there, but we can actually figure out the what are the changes in there. Or these physiochemical changes will drive to some of the significant other you know uh, changes in the in the in the in the detection platform so by by measuring this particular you know physiochemical changes uh, to these molecules the disease molecule um, we can we can figure out um, actually um, a, a, you know a, a detection platform uh, or we can find out a way of detecting uh, these diseases. Uh, this interfacial, um, in a, uh, the driving force underneath is the interaction force between these molecules 
and the, some of the electro surface. Uh, predominantly we use the gold, but then it can be used on many other surfaces. And we publish a lot of you know publications in there. And the interfacial biosensing now become a, a new platform or detecting um, the disease specific molecule. And we got a recently um, a interesting paper which published in Nature um, uh, Common, you know, on Nature Communication, I believe. And it, it showed this in you know, a 10 minutes cancer detection by measuring only the interfacial changes uh, on the you know cancers and non-cancer molecule, and uh, this was actually uh, first picked up by the Guardian. After then, it got a massive hit in Australia wide and worldwide in many uh, news media, and, and finally ended up in the Courier Mail with the front cover as well. So this is something that we our research got a lot of attention by by the many many people across the local and international community, and this to first one what I explained these devices and second one which I explained like a genetic based on screening by using the interfacial biosensing. It was actually um, um, uh, when we, we did all this research, but then over the time I realized there are some other things also need to be considered. You know, this, this technology, even though super cute, but then um, they have some of the problem. The problem number one is the sample we are dealing is extremely complex sample, which is the body fluid. They have a lot of unwanted molecule, and sometimes your target are very low in the compared to the your non-target one. And then often these target molecules or the cells or the biological entities, what they do, they cross react with the many of the non non-target present in the sample. So sometimes we're picking up the right one in this complex fluid is extremely difficult. So this challenge uh, need to be addressed whenever we are thinking of detecting or developing any of the analytical tools. So second challenge when I was working on, because most of these devices, what I showed, or current existing any devices you think of, they somehow get involved with the, some of the materials that could be metal material, metal, metal or some of the electrodes or some of the strips, something is involved in there. And interestingly, any metal molecules, any metal surface um, is, I mean, any metal actually love the biomolecule. They have the different level of the affinity toward the biomolecule. Some of the affinity may be extremely uh, insignificant, but some of the interaction is really, really significant. And this gives a little bit of the other problem, which is we call the non-specific absorption as an analytical chemist. And sometimes this drive gives you the false positive response. And often it is the one of the big problem in the many diagnostic assay, either in the um, in, in, particularly in the plant in, 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 in the human human pathology detection, but in the in the plant also I believe the same, uh, which uh, as of my you know knowledge. So these two challenges was the major problem for us, uh, you know, and I know that many of the uh, many of the analytical or bioanalytical chemists also. So we are trying to find out a solution. And since I moved to the Griffith, I was trying to um, find out an alternative and simple way of um, doing uh, the things so that can at least minimize these issues. The one of the best way I was thinking to making uh, the electrode or um, biosensor find the biomarker instead of conventional paradigm when biomarker usually goes to the biosensor surface. The shift the paradigm and see what happened or direction moving like in that way what we can do is actually essentially use this magnetic nanoparticle or inorganic some, some enzyme um, and use them as the electrode material or sometimes use them as a biosensor and see uh, whether these this, um, problems are still there or not. And we saw that, yeah, we can avoid some of the problem. Uh, for that, actually, I'm working on uh, you know, a group of smart people across Australia and internationally as well, um, making some of the magnetic nanozyme or magnetic materials. Uh, and this uh, multifunctional material has the wonderful old properties. And if anyone interested, you can go to some of the you know, invited review and some of the written review paper by uh, me and my colleagues in in this you know on the high profile some journal articles in there. So um, this nanozyme um, 
basically has one of the example I would like to show here is, is by looking this one, don't get afraid. It's not that complicated. It's very simple. Uh, you can make, you know, this is Professor Yusuke Imaoji from um, University of Queensland. He's, um, uh, he's uh, one of the technology. What he, I uh, just borrowed his material on, and we work very closely uh, to develop, um, you know, some of this uh, nanozyme material and their bio application. So this material is a, is a highly porous, nanoporous material. And we can once they have made this, you know, highly, you know, on the reproducible material. And if you can see the size and structure of this material, almost identical. And then what you can do, you can actually buy functional them. I mean, you can put the different other materials within this pore and you can engineer, you can do selective deposition of many other things. And you can um, develop a heaps of other materials from there and they would have the different you know, application size as well. So this material um, uh, gives us um, in a, in a two uh, uh, interesting uh, property, which I would like to highlight today. One of the property is uh, dispersible. They have the dispersible capture uh, as an activity, means they can capture and magnetically collect um, you know, the molecules from the complex biological fluid. And second things they can be using as an enzyme, which I just uh, told, I'll explain this one a little bit. Um, you know, in details uh, now, if I, yeah. So first thing is how they work as a dispersible capture agent. Dispersible capture agent means they can capture, collect, and magnetically purify. And if you remember that I told you, most of the biological assets are facing the problem with the non-specific adsorption and selective deposition, selective color, you know, uh, identification of rare molecules in the complex fluid. This, this more by, by uh, this dispersible capture uh, ability of this, this you know, uh, particles can actually solve that problem a little bit. So this is the, one of the uh, examples where uh, we have, uh, we would like to detect the total uh, a specific RNA in the presence of, uh, uh, in the presence of the many other RNA in, in urine sample. What we did, um, or not an urine sample is an example, we have done this one in the many other biological fluid also. What we can do actually, we can put a biotinated capture group in the mixture, and they will have the specific hybridization as they are complementary to each other. Once the hybridization occurs, this is biotinated site, and we have this magnetic bead, which I told, which has a cute, cute other engineering as well. Um, we put some of the gold and some of the functional sites as well. In many ways, we have done this one, but this is just an example. One, this tetrabidin coated this molecule and biotin at this site will be um, specific interaction, as you know, this biotin evidin uh, interaction. And the magnetically, by using the static magnet, you can just isolate them. Once the magnetically you separate them, you can wash it, purify it. But this purification steps gives you the highly purified sample. And in the final stage, what you can do, you can hit it. Uh, once you hit, and then what would happen, this hybridization will break down and you again magnetically separate this part because this streptavidin biotin bond will not be affected by this heat. And this, the other guy will be separated. This is your target. Once you get this target separated, purified target, you can read it many ways. One of the best way is I'm an electrochemist and I would like to have I'd like to have a portable device which is a very inexpensive, like plastic device or a plastic strip. Uh, definitely, my choice is to go to the electrochemistry, and we have, uh, uh, you know, put this one on the gold electrode. Like I said in the interfacial biosensing, where uh, this this DNA or RNA species or nucleic acid species will have a specific interaction on the gold surface. Once they have the specific interaction on the gold surface, you can then essentially read them by this reading is very simple uh, if you have this this dna is the negatively charged and if you have a marker on the in the liquid system with the ferrocyanide system um, then if you are an electrical chemist you are getting my my point clearly what i'm trying to say here so this will be negatively charged this negatively charged and surface has also negative charge there will be repulsion number of dna increase in there will have the increased level of the repulsion so you have the lower current, means current will change with the concentration. So that's exactly what the analytical information we are getting. And if you look at this one, this, this method and term method is the universal method. 
it's not limited to specific of this RNA. It can be detected for any DNA, any RNA, any nucleic acid you think of. No, no matter it's, it's either from the plant or it's from the human, it will work the same way. Most important thing is this method is extremely simple. In the simple in the sense is we avoided the surface modification steps. There is no surface modification steps in both. I uh, just only like, you know, you have the target and absorb it and just get the readout and no recognition layer, no transduction layer, like a conventional hybridization process is completely absent in there. So this is really a cool, a cool technology for us. So these particles can be used again in another way, like I think maybe you know that this is the conventional ELISA. What we do here is you see the HSRP, this is the killer point. Here is the, this HSRP is giving you the response, this is the readout antibody. And you have the specificity coming with this both the antibody, but anyway, this HSRP uh, is giving the response because TMB react with the HSRP and you get the color. And that is the information you are getting. So apart from this, all this, you know, uh, non-specific absorption and other issues with the ELISA, we are thinking to replace this guy, completely replace this guy and come up with an extremely inexpensive one material, which is our this inorganic materials, which I saw this, you know, magnetic oxide, iron oxide. And when we saw, we just replaced this one uh, in place of the HSRP, we use our magnetic particle, it does the same job. It's efficiency a little bit compromised, but it does the same job. And it is, it is simple because, uh, and it is cost effective also, it is extremely inexpensive, and a whole lot of other beautiful features are there. So these particles can be used in an enzyme. And it has a huge application, as, as you can imagine, because this ELISA has a huge application. This material can be placed in the ELISA. Uh, it can be used as the ELISA material. And um, you know, um, this this is the one dark example where we can use this material, like this uh, inorganic material, as a as a uh, in a two way. Like there can be a magnetic, uh, you know, uh, they can be used to collect or isolate uh, as a, as a magnetic collection. At the same time, they can be used as an enzyme. Like here, you see this uh, CD9 um, specific on antibody spe attached to one of the um, magnetic particle. We put in a fluid, body fluid, which is the plasma fluid. And in this plasma, we have the exosome as a one of the extracellular uh, basicle. And what happens is this CD9 is specific to the exosome, but CD9 uh, is specific to all kinds of exosome in the body fluid. It, 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 you know, secreted from the different organs, a different cells, a different level of the exosome. Every exosome can be, um, uh, can be, can be captured here, and then you magnetically separate them, and you have a readout system. Then, in the readout system, you put a specific antibody, which will give you the specificity. In that case, particular case, we use the PLAP as a. This is one of the uh, placental, you know, exo antibody. And we want to detect the sample of the placental diseases. And uh, fa fantastically, we uh, and we have you know just in the once once this this ELISA form and we use the TMB, we got the color. And it was actually um, uh, is one of the uh, very finest technology, very simple, very simple. Then you may well think, oh, what is the new in here? I think for me, everything is new. Everything is the new is the technique and all the other things is known by the ELISA people. But all the material, the way we did, we replaced their material is phenomenal. And we got, um, you know, this this technique not only uh, used in exosome, it can be used of the any of the surface marker. You can, I mean, protein-based marker. You think of autoantibody we tried for the autoimmune diseases, exosome, range of the exosome for the different application, many surface protein, different pathogens. Even we tried with the E. coli and other pathogens also. And um, and everywhere it, it seems like you know it's working compared to the you know uh, this conventional ELISA, and uh, it has uh, some other cute features because it's inexpensive, it's relatively rapid and um, uh, processing time also good. Uh, it can give you the both response, qualitative and quantitative both because electrochemistry will give you the quantitative. Uh, and uh, the naked eye detection with the UV visible detection will give you the uh, qualitative information. But the most important thing is. This technique, uh, you know, can give you the pass test for the major screening when you need the thousands and thousands of the sample to be screened. This can be used in there. This one also got a lot of publications in there, and we got a lot of heat in in the international and national media. Um, 
but now I'd like to show next to, you know, I already spent 22 minutes. I'd like to spend some, some more time on, on the my journey to the plant pathology. So this journey begins, um, Rebecca Ford, one of the you know finest pathologists working at Griffith, uh, um, and my close colleague at Griffith. Rebecca was actually one of, uh, she was the HDR convener when some of my student was presenting um, or, um, you know, uh, presenting their PhD confirmation report and we, different examination steps and different stages, uh, you know, she as, as a HDR convener, she, she, she needs to attend in the seminar. So she attended multiple seminars there. And I remember one day she just told me that this technique can be actually uh, used in the plant pathology. Uh, or at least we need to try there. And that's journey begins actually. So while she told me this, I was just looking at the, looking at the, you know, okay, is it, is it, then I was just looking at what is, what we can do there. So one thing said that ideally at the same time in 2016, uh, this one actually, uh, one of the motivational slides I used to show almost everywhere. So this is a weird blast outbreak in Bangladesh, uh, in my home country, where um, this within weeks, um, almost, <laughs> And the yield loss was, uh, you know, almost 100%. Um, this is this outbreak uh, actually heartbreaking for many of the farmer, and um, and severe loss in in the economic uh, point of view. The it 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 caught in actually spread to the estimated almost uh, several. I mean, 15,000 hectares land, which is the 16% of the almost all cultivated wheat area in Bangladesh. And the gentleman, uh, I was lucky enough to get contact with this gentleman who was um, actually identified for the first time and rapidly, uh, almost within a few weeks, uh, this this uh, pathogen was responsible in there. So then I look at this one, okay, this type of outbreak can be, oh my God, it's, it's, it's a massive loss uh, in the in, in the agricultural point of view, and uh, we need to do something in there. That urgency and Rebecca's discussion definitely uh, something uh, you know inspired me. So I was looking at what people usually do for for their plant disease detection. So I look at this and then I find conventionally what they do basically ELISA, PCR, and LAM, and some other conventional techniques. And there are advanced level of some other techniques are there, but these are the massively used, you know, technique for the disease diagnosis, um, or particularly, um, you know, there are different level of the programs are there in the, you know, in the in the agricultural industry, and these techniques are is massively used in there. And then I look at this carefully, as already you know, you are the expert in this so analytical performance. Why these are brilliant, not no problem at all. They works. But still, they have uh, some of the some of the compromise issues in there, which is sensitivity, specificity. Sometimes, some of the particularly Eliza has also issues with the selectivity or all, all this, you know, uh, cost also an issue, capital cost issue, and a whole lot of other things. Most important problem there is some of these technique are not portable. The farmer cannot use in their field. And this actually, so when we think of this, okay, this is the farm. I would like to detect this one in farm in the farm. No, it's not possible. What essentially you need to do, collect the sample, send this on the centralized lab. They will take some time, which is the which is the days and weeks sometime, and then they will return this one to the farmer again. So this is the issue of portability. Time is an issue, also cost an issue. So these are the major some problems in there still, which many people are working on. And then I look at, okay, uh, so what a farmer would like to do, or, or as a plant pathologist or plant diagnostic people, what would be the ideal scenario for a plant pathologist to have a uh, diagnostic method? So then uh, if you look at this one, definitely imagine a farmer that has a handheld device which has the highly accurate performance and it giving a very sensitive response, which is suitable uh, in, to detect the pathogen uh, in, the, in the onset of the disease. It also specific to specific to the target, very specific to target. It do not, uh, I mean, it does not cross talk with the cross talk with the other pathogen uh, present in there. Um, and um, uh, there are in the from some soil I learned a lot of things because there is a lot of other parameters uh, which can your know, environmental factors and so on. The other factors are there. So everywhere you can get every time you can get a very specific response in there. And then imagine like this is handheld. 
So uh, you have all this performance with a handheld device, and it also can give rapid detection, not also very expensive. Farmer can use it without, without knowing a lot of knowledge is in there. So if a device have all this performance, oh, this would be a something ideal, right? But uh, I don't believe this, this would be uh, very uh, impossible to get. And uh, if you look at this on the similar, like WHO Health Organization, WHO recommendation for a portable or POC device, this need to have the characteristics. They need to be affordable, sensitive specific, user friendliness, rapid equipment, and this need to be delivered. And uh, this is the POC, uh, this all these characteristics what we have um, um, for particularly for the infectious disease detection and the disease which spread like COVID-19 things, you know, th this is the sum of the device which we need uh, at home medicine or at, in, at, at particularly in the doctor's clinic. But I believe the similar in the plant field or, or farm may be something possible you know if uh, the research drive towards this direction and many people are trying i think the future of the plant disease di disease diagnostic and surveillance uh, particularly in the diagnostic side this would be something uh, very interesting to look at next 10 15 years so i was um, then look at this okay what is the current currently people are doing in there so this is the one of the example. Maybe already you guys know this. This is um, uh, is a, a mark play. They say this is actually mobile and real time plant disease platform. It, uh, it developed by uh, a, a group of scientists at John Innes Center in UK, and they are using this one in the weed blast management in Ethiopia. And uh, this is if you go and Google them or YouTube, you can see a lot of videos from there. And I have seen some of their wonderful publications also. What they essentially they are doing. They are transferring enter their lab in a band. So they have the lamp technology technique in there. They have some of the characterization technique, all the centrifugation or relevant all the processes within the lab, within the within the band. So they can move this band to you know wherever they need. And it's actually doing the good. Uh, very, very good. It's not maybe lab on a chip. It's not like uh, everything is in built in a, in a in a small device, but it does their job, and it is it is saving uh, you know a lot of things like uh, human transport, sample transport, and a lot of um, a lot of you know um, and also another thing is when whenever you think of the sample transporting from field to the somewhere else, there is some other issue which I will be talking soon, and uh, that means it, it it's really good. And second example is if you look at just browse them, you'll see this another. Example, which is the lateral flow immunosuppressive based devices, uh, particularly in in the example I give the wind blast in in my country back home in Bangladesh. This group is developing one of the technique exactly identical to this. What they do is so they are detecting lateral flow immunosuppressive. Is it, it, this is like ELISA based things, but you have the antibody coated some of the you know smart beads which can create the color, and uh, just like a pregnancy detection kit, uh, it works very brilliant. And this also, uh, this is actually a true portable uh, platform. But then the problem is, there is, this also has an issue of the lot of, lot of processing uh, is off chip. A lot of sample, uh, you know, steps are off chip. And so this just on the detection part and the sample, sample pure sample, you know, you need to put in there and then get the detection. So there is a, there is a, you know, some of the some of the dirty part is not included in the in the part, but it's only beautiful component. But it, it's also brilliant. But it is maybe uh, very close to the uh, complete portable platform. But another one, this is I love most. This part of this plant um, in a natural plant. What they say is this is uh, this is uh, actually they are detecting some uh, volatile organic uh, you know uh, so, you know organic uh, you know marker. So what they do during the infection, during infection, actually some bacterial infection, what they happen, there is some of the uh, volatile marker actually secret or produced in the system uh, or on, on leaf. And that's is this some, I, if I remember this, this, this could be gaseous to hexanol, some of the molecules create or secret on the, during the infection. So what they have now, they have a device uh, and colorimetric, you know, readout in, you know, printed a, a, a strip where when the gaseous, you know, target or gaseous, this molecule goes and they can specifically pick up this one. 
So this is a wonderful one uh, technique and uh, can be used in, in field and which they are doing in published in 2019. And after then I saw the massive uh, hit by, by this technique. So what we are doing in in um, in our uh, with Rebecca, actually we are trying to do, OK, let's see, there's a good learning from all the all of this. Let's let's do something in our lab and see whether we can uh, we can do something uh, exactly similar or move this one to the plant science. Uh, essentially, a group of uh, plant pathologists involved. I'm the only one who uh, understand nothing about the plant, but then uh, these are the you know good uh, good people who are working with uh, the PhD student, some postdocs, and two of the expert Rebecca and Jeremy there. And uh, we built a platform uh, technology um, uh, for a uh, portable sensor, uh, for portable uh, platform you know, sensor uh, for botrytis scenario and botrytis fabi in, 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 in for the chickpea. And uh, this is just only an example, but this technology is not limited to particular these diseases. We have tested this, and I'm not going to explain any of the details of this technique. Uh, we have tested this one uh, with a sample um, uh, in okay, semi, I would not say completely portable in the in the field, but semi if it's shade house and semi field in Saudi, in Saudi, as you know. And we are now um, uh, trying to find out many other applications of this uh, technique. Um, and this is essentially what we are doing. Uh, uh, we are, it is as a DNA based on technique and uh, it can be all the component is so in the photograph. It, it is a cute one technique. So these are the, all the learning and next seven, eight minutes, I'll be showing something interesting, which will be, uh, you know, um, will be, you will be very excited about that. So actually after what well, I'm doing with all this work, um, I uh, yeah, I was um, actually um, got uh, introduced uh, or, or or I I I, I discussed with um, you know uh, this gentleman as you know he introduced me already uh, he's very you know name in Saleh I believe um, uh, uh, Dr Samsel Buya so he when I talked to him um, to translate this technology um, or one of the technology in sugarcane disease diagnosis particularly for the management he was very excited. And then he told me, let's let's do something. And 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 he he guide me about the, some of the diseases. I remember still I have this guidebook for SRA disease small book. Uh, I read it many many times, and I was trying to understand all this. Even I couldn't remember all the pathogen name, but uh, you know I was trying to um, um, learning a little bit of the, all this disease. And few diseases he mentioned at that time. I was interested uh, to develop a technique for the very first time with the LSD. With the lip skull disease, the, you know, is 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 caused by this bacteria. And and major cause, what he told and what I learned there is the problem is this guy even the early one set time, very early time. This is asymptomatic. I mean, it's very very difficult to even uh, uh, detect. But then I realized there's economic um, damage, and the damage this this disease uh, do is really really. Um, bad and a lot of you know significant significant crops loss uh, could happen and then i realized that what uh, samsul and uh, his colleagues are doing uh, in sra particularly for disease screening and also from some of the paper what i learned is and most importantly i attended one of the one of the workshop in 2019 uh, which was run by samsul nickel and some other good people in there and i realized that all this technique what they are using actually essentially lamp eliza qpcr microarrays and all these things you know okay all are beautiful but problem there number one this none of them are in the field you need to move your you know sample to the as i said before also sample to the centralized lab or wood food station or some other other station you know and get the analysis and then send the data to the farmer or the grower you know so this the, the issues is there one of the big issues here also when you're transferring this sample it is is now question would come this authentic diagnostic outcomes is maybe an issue because there is a sample, lot of human interaction there. And then cost also involved, time also involved. These are the issues. I'm not against of any of this technique. They are beautiful, but cost, time, and this you know, non-portable nature of this um, could be an issue uh, to find out. So I was talking with Samsul and then Samsul told, let's, let's put a, uh, something 
and see see whether SRA helps us or not. He put this grant, Innovation Catalyst grant, um, in 2018. And I remember SRA was kind enough to support us. And essentially what we plan to do, develop a proof of concept, very simple proof of concept method, and, and, and convert um, and use this, this proper concept uh, to detect some of the sample collected from the Woodford you know, LSD screening trial. And, and when we did this one, um, actually we got very excited and um, we got some good, because in the human side, human pathology side, the method is all, almost um, optimized and um, uh, we have done a lot of work in there. So that prior knowledge helped us to move this one rapidly with the minimum support also. And uh, two of the gentlemen, uh, a student, uh, and one postdoc and student, see, they worked very hard for, for getting some of the really good outcomes in there. We got a news and Ken connection in last year, uh, I think, yeah, uh, and also recently one paper published on this, on based on this, you know, very preliminary some of the data, like whatever we need to, you know, send there. But a lot of in details technique and technologies are, are not published or disclosed in there anyway. So what we have done is um, I'll be uh, telling a little bit, not in details in there. So this is one of the technique um, which we use um, is HRP still we use. Uh, we want to bring like a just photocopy of the ELISA, but using the nanotechnology some of the knowledge, using also naked eye like qualitative and quantitative readout. But essentially what we did, we uh, from the sugarcane xylem sap, we extracted uh, in our own way uh, on a newly developed one method uh, where we extracted the, uh, the DNA and once this DNA is separated, which is not very long steps, all together it will take around uh, less than an hour. And once this DNA is uh, got separated and highly purified, we put this on in the electro surface, which using the cure to electrochemistry, uh, we can uh, and uh, and also color and uh, also you know on um, uh, colorimetry, we can detect uh, first three level of the detection. You can see. First level of detection is by changing the color. You can immediately detect by your naked eye. Uh, and the second level of the detection, you can go for the colorimetry to the semi-quantification. As you know, colorimetric method is the semi-quantitative. Uh, and then finally, you can get the total quantitative information from the electrochemical readout, uh, which was actually uh, uh, great. And we also uh, recently uh, tested the same things with the nanozyme, which I was talking right from the beginning. Uh, this uh, we can avoid all this enzyme and things like that, and also we can reduce um, a few steps in there. Uh, this is only two step on method, and and we can detect this, and the performance was even much better than uh, what we achieved before. So uh, this is uh, some of the data. Which uh, if you look at this on uh, some of the synthetic sample, you can see the concentration, and you'll be surprised. The, the concentration we can go is uh, 100 femtomolar, and and this is the sum of the trial sample. This is low concentration, means uh, it is uh, something, I would say the rating and the sample name, in, in the, I couldn't remember now, I have the following slide, is this uh, this this is the sample with the less, uh, you know, DNA concentration present, uh, I mean, um, um, pathogen are present, and uh, some of the other sample, which is 133, this this guy was the high bacterial concentration present. So uh, you can see uh, uh, we can detect in you know, a different um, uh, level of the um, detection, I mean, um, pathogen concentration by using this colorimetric method and quantitative method was brilliant. This is very significant response. You can see um, in a standard edition method also we applied for uh, find out the low concentration limit. But this is the some yeah this is the what I was telling. This is something some of the play field sample collected from the output trial. Here is the S means susceptible. This in means intermediate. Uh, R means resistance. You can see the different level of the response we got. Initially we are very um, uh, definitely. This is not the data uh, um, is like like you know you see the textbook. But what you see, okay, something we have, we can see this this uh, this sample this method is picking up some of the pathogen concentration, uh, um, and, and these samples are giving a different level of the you know um, pathogen. We have a wonderful story to collect all this sample from the Woodford you know trial. Uh, <laughs> it's just all fun. Um, and, and after collecting this one, but then um, kind of okay, is this data is it is right? We need to we need to just tell that. 
Yeah, these are the concentration we got, but then we need to also validate this, right? So we have done immediately validate some of the data and some of the sample, on, and we have also other validation data, but this this data was quite good with the with the qPCR, and you can see this, our our uh, trend and the qPCR trend are almost identical, and sometimes even more sensitive and better in this. And we are quite excited with that. We sent this paper and we got accepted this one. Um, in um, in as I said before. So in summary, actually, I am almost 44 minutes. So in summary, um, in a, a we I just showed one of the method um, um, that can be used for LSD. Uh, detection, but this is not limited to LSD. It can be for the other uh, disease as well. But this is none of the steps. Uh, none of the steps in in uh, in portable, like like a single portable device, which can move to the field. Uh, we are working towards that. And but the beautiful some of the component here is which I already explained is relatively cheaper and very rapid um, in terms of the compared to the other other techniques. But then uh, uh, this preliminary data helped us a little bit. This proof of concept pushed a lot. And we last year SRA was so kind and I'm grateful to Samsul and, and Nicole to do a lot of you know uh, underneath work um, to push this on for ARC link is done. And we got successful in that. So this uh, fund is uh, now with us. It is in the final stage of. Uh, we have just started the work. Um, uh, and uh, Nicole and I'm grateful to again. I'm saying Nicole and some soul is there. Rebecca and um, and these two gentlemen, um, and Fan and a, and Nam Chang is in, in microfluidics and uh, micro, micro device expert. And Rebecca, as he, I already told, is a plant pathologist. She will be um, helping me in the plant side, and this uh, two person will be helping in the SRA side. So we will. We are hoping um, this to just start in in uh, next to within within a week. Uh, you know, work. Um, we want to main goal is to build a device that can be used uh, in SRA uh, field, particularly um, for the for the diagnosis and the, also the management. I'd like to just thank to my people who worked with me. All these beautiful people, mainly this this bold uh, names uh, are the key people in the SRA, um, you know, kind of work and the other work, and I'm, I'm grateful to them. Um, and I'd like to thanks to all the fundings. Uh, I have an HMRC funding, ARC funding. We got MRFF funding, also multiple DP uh, ongoing. Link is um, one, and we got recently also Australia India Strategic Research Fund for COVID-19, and, and before also um, that that SRA logo is there for this uh, two big support. One is for this uh, you know innovation catalyst grant, which is only twenty-five thousand dollar grant, but then it it created a lot of pathway, and I'm grateful to SRA for that. And thank you for listening. And I'd like to take any question you may have. Thank you, Shadiki, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I um, hope that you have found it of, of value. Um, just we've got a, you can see perhaps I've put a short survey there or link to a short survey in the chat and would really appreciate if you can take probably two to three minutes to fill that in at some stage. If you just click on the link and you can open it up um, separately. Um, it just helps us to understand, you know, who, who's attending our webinars and what they're finding, what they're getting value from and, and you know, then can support us in understanding what we can provide um, in future webinars. Um, so now on to questions. So if if anyone would like to either type a question in or put your hand up or speak up, we don't have a huge number of participants, so it's probably quite simple to manage if you'd like to just unmute and ask a question. Hello, Professor Siddiqui. Hi. I have a question. Yes, uh, that was a very wonderful presentation and uh, very informative as well. Thank you for that. And uh, I have a very simple and quick question about that regarding the LSD de detection. Uh, using your uh, magnetic nanozyme. So uh, based on that, uh, during the preparation of the magnetic nanozyme, you might have used very cross-linking techniques uh, for that. So after cross-linking techniques, uh, what would be your comments on its peroxidase mimicking activity as you are replacing it with the HRP? So when we are uh, uh, using cross-linking chemistry or you are surface modifying it, uh, they would be compromised as you, are, you have already mentioned about that. So what would be your comments on that, sir? 
because in comparison to HRP, what was the suppression? As uh, you have already shown that it was alongside with the QPCR, the results were quite uh, correlative. So uh, I just wanted to know, wondering what would be your comments on that? Uh, how was the suppression? Thank you for that. <laughs> I was not <laughs> expecting though this because this is Thomas chemistry uh, question, but yes, true. This uh, the the this nanoparticle uh, or magnetic nanozyme in our case, as you know, in Australia also multiple other group are very active in this field, but in our case we ha we use the porous iron oxide. This porosity of this iron oxide is the key uh, to this you know this electron tunneling and this in and I believe it's not yet uh, we published anything but I believe these are the key uh, uh, for this you know nanozyme activity but uh, this this porosity severely affected by the surface absorption or biomolecular attachment on the surface. We need to play um, in backward and forward to find uh, the optimal condition. And the, the condition where we find uh, is better. I think maybe this slide I haven't shown because it was too much chemistry. You maybe for you, for you, can you see this one? So you can see this, this uh, you know, this is the kinetics in yeah. data in there where uh, you can see the miscellaneous maintained kinetics information um, is in the last, last slide. Which is quite quite sensitive, but it is not as good at HRP. It is almost 80% of the HRP activity, and it does our job. Uh, it's true, but then if we do not use any of the biomolecular DNA or protein on the surface, and the mimicking activity go over 95%, but uh, it, it reduced significantly, and we need to optimize that. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, it answers my question. Thank you. No problem. Oh, I lost my slide. No, 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 no. I don't want to lost. Yeah, it's lost. I think so, someone, yes. yeah, okay. someone actually raised their hand. Raise hand. I think is Jenny. Jenny. Yes. Jenny? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. So I come. I'm from SRA, and I'm mainly into molecular biology. So I'm familiar with the mechanism enrichment for DNA sample. Uh, so my question is basically, what's the advantage of using this um, similar, it's also use magnetic to get the enrich you target. What's the advantage of the new technology versus a traditional one? Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, that's good. So in terms of, I believe, Okay, I need to maybe bring that one uh, to where is that one I put. Yeah, so in the SRA point of view. So I think uh, this is all about the, the performance wise. So if you go for the, uh, uh, in the conventional technique, like if you go use the magnetic beads and all these things, um, and and our nanozyme technique. So first uh, example, first first you know benefit is cost wise. Definitely enzyme you cannot buy in less than three hundred dollars. And and uh, definitely and uh, in nanoparticle I believe you can you can produce in gram, and one time you use it you can three four years you can use. So it is massively inexpensive materials. It does the same job. Since so this is, I mean, many component of our te technology are are home uh, in in at, at home made. And other thing is, uh, you maybe didn't realize that we use also acute uh, a, a DNA extraction process, which we didn't disclose anywhere yet, and that also significantly or one of the significant innovation in there. And main goal of this, what we explained today, is not the, our. Uh, we are not stop here. Our main. These are the last, some of the some of the things we have done. But we will we will build all these steps in a sing, simple device, like simple in to result out. All this format will be in a in a, in a single device format without any human um, involvement. Like human you know, involvement, the cell is. Uh, you don't need to process all the you know sample processing things in between the steps. So this will be you know dri driven by a system um, in, in the, the device. That is the ultimate goal. So, but then in terms of the benefit is cost. 
And second thing is it is portable. You can put this one in the field. Farmer can use it or a, a non expert can use in the field, um, which, which is our our aim, which is actually if you look at this Rebecca's device, um, um, which I developed with Rebecca, that 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 device is um, can be used. And most another thing is our our technique is much more sensitive than um, than the conventional technique that means in the very early time of the um, uh, disease where the symptom is not appeared uh, in that stage also we can detect the disease so this are the some of the cute benefit underneath on top of the portability cost and the time i guess the, can i can i add something uh, yes yes please I guess another thing, I guess the most important thing is the portability. What he mentioned, Siddiqui mentioned at his beginning that we want to take the lab into the field, not yeah. just a sending thing into the lab. The second uh, uh, thing is that uh, also, if you see some of the slide, we can actually use this for disease screening in earlier than before because some of the disease like deep skull disease, they don't actually, uh, this is hard to actually, they don't have, uh, de they don't develop disease symptom. Uh, yes. They are very on and off symptom. So you can actually do it without uh, looking at this uh, thing. So we, without the symptom, we can actually de definitely develop one to actually um, get the sim uh, detection also we can we should be able to do the screening because one of the slides he shows that we can de uh, determine the resistance susceptible and in intermediate variety using this technique so which is a bit of a uh, yeah if it's what it still needs to be lots of work done but it's done it's actually impact our breeding program and disease screening program significantly. Thank you. Thank you. Another hand. That is uh, Jenny again. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I really yeah. like this okay. uh, technique. Just yeah. wondering. Um, so it's majority of the material is homemade. Mm -hmm. Are we able to make any SRA? Uh, what was that question again? Uh, uh, so the nano, uh, uh, the, the, the nano porous yes, magnetic. Yes. Are yeah. we able to make it within uh, oh, okay. SRA? Uh, why not? We can we can uh, like like the way I'm 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 learning from uh, you know uh, learning from um, you know Samsul uh, and Nicole at uh, the same way. Maybe we can because now we will have. Um, Ma, I think the the grant this uh, this linkage grant is allowing us two PhD student and one of the PhD student and one of the postdoc will be closely working with the Samsul and and Nicole also they will be often visiting this uh, you know SRA output station um, yeah maybe they can they can set this nanoparticle synthesis thing in SRA but. Um, as you know, this is the wet lab synthesis process. So once we made that, we need to again characterize. So uh, these are the we we central you know characterize facility as UQ or you know um, or or um, at uh, Nathan. So but then at the end of the day, yeah, we can we can uh, you know. But uh, thing is, once we synthesize this material, uh, we can pass. To, and we already have a lot of materials. I have some collaborator I put in the slide. And uh, we have a lot of materials we, we can pass to the SRA. And this this is just in, you can store in your band stop for months and years and no problem at all. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, can I have just one last question? No problem. Uh, yeah, <laughs> because uh, I'm marker based on doing the molecular marker. Yeah. And in, you're probably aware the SNPs marker, single yes, nucleotide yes, polymorphism. Yes. Yeah, you think will this method be able to have that sensitivity to distinguish yes. different yeah. variant? Yeah, OK, a uh, SNP, uh, yeah, I, uh, because as I said, this this talk was different. My my PhD time, I did a lot of work. I think maybe I have multiple paper on SNP, but um, OK, one of the things this is something is very similar to the uh, single, uh, you know, uh, mutation detection. 
It is something we should methylation, DNA methylation, that technique. So uh, and one single base, um, you know, changes in the in there, uh, we can pick it up. So means one of the methylation, one sing, single CPG, I mean, you know, cytosine, when it converted to the methyl cytosine, we can pick it up. So I believe, um, uh, uh, because none of the data I have here to show, but we have not tried with the nanozyme and picking up the single, uh, you know, this mutation change, but uh, I, I'm sure that it can be done because uh, uh, even though um, uh, with this this nanozyme you can you can go for the like femtomolar to lower femtomolar detection. So that knowledge is saying that if if we can, uh, if we can incorporate some of the cute, uh, you know, the amplification steps underneath uh, on top of this nanozyme. It can be it can be detected because in the SNP detection, all about the, uh, the, the, the very specifically, very, very specifically, which achieve this single one changes in there. The, that the, that's why it maybe uh, method need to be highly specific and sensitive, but that can be done. We have not tried, but that can be done. Siddiqui, there is a question from uh, Fatima Jain Farhana. She said that in which way nanozyme attached with the plant pathogen? Could you tell us? Okay, um, nanozyme pathogen, which way is attached with the plant pathogen? In this particular particular slide, actually, we did not attach any of the. If you look at this slide, so is that one? Um, okay, let's go to. This slide. So what we did actually, we did not. Um, it's not coming. Uh, we did not actually attach any, um, uh, you know, pathogen directly there. What we did, actually, uh, we lyse this. I mean, we extracted the DNA, nucleic acid, uh, and using a specific marker, which I explained in the you know first few slide, uh, or using using a specific uh, you know probes. We isolate uh, our target one magnetically. Once we get, uh, you know, separated this one, uh, and and then we can use, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this this entire one <coughs> as a detection. If you look at this, this is the target. Now you can put here one of the capture probe. This this is the streptomycin coated. You can put a capture probe which is the bioattenuated in there. This bioattenuated capture probe can be specifically pick up uh, your target, and once they get you know attached magnetically, you can purify. But yes, the, to to specific answer to your question, you can even put your pathogen directly in here. But we need to put an antibody. Uh, if we put an antibody here by using the coupling chemistry you can bring your pathogen, that antibody will be specific to the pathogen. And this way you can detect uh, this, uh, you can separate the pathogen as well. But pathogen directly, yeah, you can pick, there are maybe some interaction there, but we have not tried this way. Yeah. All right, well, Thank you, everyone. We've gone a little bit over time, so um, I'm hoping that everyone has had a chance to answer uh, to ask a question if they would like to. Um, I guess if you haven't, um, you could perhaps email me and I could pass it on to Shadiki, or we can um, I can get you his contact details if you have any more um, information that you would like. Uh, I'll, I'll perhaps we could. I'm not sure whether Shadiki, whether you're happy to um, upload the presentation so that people can access the list of references because I know that there were quite a few throughout the presentation so if you're happy with that we can we can do that um have it available um, no not a problem not a problem all good okay all right so the recording of the webinar will be uploaded and we'll upload the presentation as well then um so that there's people can have that access um so thanks very much we've got just a, a bit of a plug for our next webinar which is at the end of April and the 29th um it's it's the topic is high throughput phenotyping to improve clonal selection. So um, all the details of that are on our website if you'd like to have a look. Uh, if you have any questions about that or any access difficulties, um, please let me know. My contact details are on the events as they're listed on the website as well. 
So thank you very much, um, Shadiki, and thanks everyone again for attending. Have a lovely day. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, um, Samsul, and you, and everyone attended. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.